Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, here along with Matt Allen, and we are your KTR Car Guys, here with you every Saturday from 11 to noon, right here on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. At Bumper to Bumper Radio, we are helping you, the motoring public, have a better overall car experience. The best way we know how to do that is to educate you on your car. So, to get a hold of the show, 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. Today on the Bumper to Bumper Roadmap, shop hopping. It's not good for you. We'll talk a little bit about shop hopping. Of course, we're taking your phone calls and lubrication, lubrication, lubrication. What the heck, Matt, is a tribologist? I don't know, Dave. I'd have to get the Wikipedia back out. <laughs> I can't memorize it. But today we have brought in Jason Cronland. I hope I said that right, Jason. And he is a tribologist. And an a, uh, interesting thing, Jason is a was a listener listening to the show and, and uh, has a laboratory here in Phoenix where they do engine oil analysis. Lab One is the name of it. And it's been here for, de- for decades. Yes, and, and 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 we talk about engine oils, and and you know I used to have a fleet of tow trucks, and we would do oil analysis to see how that engine is acting. Uh, big fleets over the road trucks do oil analysis, and and it's an application that we can use in your car, your your normal everyday on the road car. We can look for trends in the oil and things that are happening inside that engine. The, it's the uh, the blood work, I guess. It's like going down to the doctor and they send you off to the lab. <laughs> and they, you know, there's all these numbers. Well, that's Jason's area of expertise, but we're going to twist this whole thing around and, and, and talk about oils. And, and, and do you really need a 3,000 mile change? Is it 5,000? What's happening inside that engine? And Jason, uh, looking at that oil, well, first off, thanks for coming. Well, thank you guys. And, and thanks Pleasure for to be here. Thanks for being a listener too. That that we really appreciate that. But having a look inside the oil, at the oil, is a big picture of what's happening when you're uh, with the oil. What's what's going on inside the engine? Just like the blood for the body, I guess, right? Yeah, exactly the same. You know, every every year we try to go to the doctor, get our blood tested, to see how everything's going. Well. Oil analysis is the same thing. You know, it's the lifeblood of your engine, your transmission, gearbox, what have you. And so if with an oil analysis, you can actually see what is happening with your engine. And oil analysis itself is a predictive tool, not a reactive. And so we can say, okay, we need to schedule some maintenance on your engine or your transmission, your differential, or even your coolant system if you have coolant tested. And so it's, it's a vital part of just a routine maintenance package. Well, one of the things that we're meeting Jason was, you know, I, w- I always would tell customers, they would say, you know, this oil is, you know, $15 and this oil is $10. Is it really a difference? And I would always say, I don't know. I'm not a chemist. <laughs> well, now I know one. <laughs> so, well, yeah. So I, 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 Jason, he actually tested 32 different brands of transmission fluid for me because I just wanted to see what the difference was and how different they were. And I'm amazed at what you can learn by oil analysis. I mean, there's so much there. Well, you know, and we were talking before the show, the show, and one of the things I asked Jason is, so this oil meets the specification. It, it uh, ASMI or whatever the European spec is, you look at the label on the back of any oil can or any oil container, it says it meets the specification. Well, are they the same? And the answer, you don't know. You pour them in a glass, a clear glass, they look the same. You put them in the car, the car doesn't run any different. But... Uh, you know, I guess you can buy cheap vodka and you can buy good vodka, too. <laughs> it, all, it all looks the same, yeah. right? The, so, Jason, what is it that makes a can of Acme oil uh, not equal to maybe, let's just uh, say, Valvoline or any other brand? And we're not talking the difference between conventional and synthetic, but let's just right. take two like oils. You're going to see things in that oil analysis that tell you more about how the oil starts its life even, right? Oh, that's it, exactly. Because every every formulation of oil is, or every blend of oil that's out there, every maker has a certain chemistry that they put in their oil, and that's called your additive package. And every manufacturer uses a a specific additive package so they know, okay, this is my brand oil. If there's any concerns or questions and the oil companies ask, they look at that additive package first things off and ask, "Is, is our additives here or is there someone else's additives in here? 
And so every manufacturer of oil blends to a certain requirement for their spec. And the, yes, what, does it meet the API rating? Absolutely. So do the the um, so you have one oil now? They put their additives in there. There's nothing that stops somebody else from copying that, I guess, and saying, "Well, we're going to do this too." But some of those might be what I would I'm just use the genetic marker. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have anything to do with how the oil actually operates. It's just something in there that lets them know it's theirs. Is there some of that going on? There are trace additives in there, but most of the manufacturers use a specific detergent dispersant additive package, and those are pretty much standard uh, throughout every brand of oil. It's what they utilize is tracers like titanium or uh, moly or uh, magnesium or boron even in some cases as a tracer to say this is our oil. Okay. And then the other things like I think zinc mm -hmm. is one thing. We'll say it makes it taste better or makes it work better. So you put a little bit. That's the spices in the oil that really make right. it good. So right. a cheap oil may have less zinc where your, your name brand top of the shelf, top shelf oil – that still makes the spec is clearly a way different oil because it has more, what would you find? Zinc, I know, is one of them. Right. You, <clears throat> pardon me. Zinc and phosphorus are your dispersant additive packages, and each one will vary depending on who's blending the oil. The other key uh, additives in your oil is magnesium and calcium, which is your detergents, and that keeps the engine clean and, and helps prevent sludge formation as well as those dispersants. Um, so every manufacturer will have certain criteria of how much of that is in there. Now, EPA has also gotten involved and said there's certain limits as how high you can go for your, your zinc or your zinc additive levels. But, you know, mo like I said, most oil brands will have a specific blend of those those additives. Well, I, and I I think I know I'm right with with uh, with I think I think I know, but with the, <laughs> I'm uh, glad we've got an expert in this. With studio. <laughs> with uh, zinc is a big one. The rot mm -hmm. the hot rodders, the old uh, Porsche engines, for example, they want a lot of zinc. Your old air cooled stuff, maybe a, a car with a solid lifter. Right. I've I've seen and heard of people in the past they build an engine, put it in brand new, and they'll wipe out the cam lobes on a on a new Porsche engine. Uh, it's done because that zinc is a very, very valuable lubricant. But like you said, the EPA right. had to get it out. I think right. they've still got it over in Europe. They have the, higher zinc packages yeah. in Europe, right? That is correct. And and the zinc, you know, we and these flat older generation motors, the you know the old Chevys and all the flat tappet cam engines that are out there, they need that zinc on those those cam lobes, or else they're just going to flatten. And they can flatten very quickly, 20, 30 minutes, and they're done. Maybe even quicker. And so, you know, personally, I, I run diesel engine oil in my old car because it's got the zinc additive to keep to keep the tappets happy. Ah, okay. So that that is diesel engine oil, though, is typically like a 1540. Correct. But it's okay because I guess when you had that engine built, you made sure the bearing tolerances were built in a fashion that can handle that, that uh, I guess, the the winter weight of the oil on startup or well both the winter and the even the operating temperature viscosity because they're they are different than a 30 weight and so you have to have a little bit bigger tolerances so that oil will flow through those bearing surfaces and give you adequate lubrication well i think probably you know we got an oil expert here i think probably the biggest question we talked about it before the show that everybody wants to know is how often do i change my oil you know is it three thousand miles is it five thousand miles we could talk about all the stuff's in the oil but you know, that, that's a big one that's on everybody's mind in their checkbook, and how often do I need to do this? Well, but I think it goes back to that's a loaded question because we talked about the difference between Acme oil and the top shelf oil. Well, if you're getting a $12 oil change somewhere, guess which oil you're getting? Mm. So, you know, it, it it defies all logic. I mean, simple do the math. Go to the store and look at what top shelf motor oil costs. Go look at what a filter costs. That's more than what a lot of people advertise for an oil change. So the, the economic engine, like you say, Dave, it doesn't add up. Right. There, there's something wrong with that picture. So you, you, you're getting what you pay for, or maybe you're not getting what you pay for, or you're, getting, you're not getting what you think you get. So if you use that cheap oil, no, you can't stretch that oil change. But if you're using the good one, maybe you can, as long as the car's not falling apart around the oil. 
Well, there's just so much we can talk about at OIL, 602-277-5827. Let's find out what's on your mind, and when we come back, we'll also talk about oil brand hopping. Is that a good idea? You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, here along with my good friend, occasionally, Matt Allen, and we've got Jason Cronlin from Lab One, which is here in town, and they do oil analysis and we're talking about oil analysis. The CSI of oil. The CSI <laughs> of oil. And we went to lunch here with Jason not too long ago. We went and checked out the lab. And it is amazing what you can learn about oil. And they do a lot of oil analysis for big equipment and earth moving type, yeah. type stuff. And they can really, they like to see a trend of how an engine is wearing and, and measure the metals in there and what's happening with the engine, looking for coolants and stuff. So a little bit, it can be preventative as far as you can head off an issue with an engine. On some of these engines, they're a little more expensive than, than what you got in your uh, regular automobile. But still, one of the things we talked about was, you know, if you're looking at buying a vehicle or selling a vehicle, you could do an oil analysis and, and give this to the future owner. Say, hey, I just had it checked out. Here's what everything looks like. It's and better than a Carfax in some cases. It is better <laughs> than a Carfax. So I think, you know, that may be something... You know, we got to talk to the bumper to bumper shops about is you know taking oil samples and getting them over to Jason so people can know how their car's doing. Well, and we also I mentioned that we didn't talk about it before the show, but the CSI of oil. You do some analysis for insurance companies and, and, oh. and, and try to find. You know, there's the fraud. This guy all of a sudden's got a rod knock in his car. Next thing you know, it mysteriously. Uh, bottomed out and now it needs an engine or there you, know, you might find some coolant in that analysis and, and uh, or it caught on fire with a little bit of italian lightning <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah the car's out in the desert torch just right after you learned it, it had some water in the oil huh maybe it doesn't add up so, so there's an element of that to your business too which i think is, is pretty cool yeah yeah we do we do not too many insurance samples but we do have insurance samples coming in where we have to see well was there a pre-existing condition basically right yeah, why did this car get torched? So <laughs> let's take, we've got Jim on the phone from Sun City with a lubrication question. Go ahead, Jim, you're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, I've got a uh, uh, a tea bucket that's got a uh, the old block, the old style 302. It's up to a 347 stroker motor uh, with a blower, 500 plus horsepower out of the motor. Sounds slow. <laughs> <laughs> Probably can't keep the tires on it. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, can't keep the front end on the ground. But the uh, question I've got is I'm running the Valvoline uh, 1540 in it now. Mm -hmm. hey, you were talking about you know, your detergents and your zinc. Right. Uh, because this is, this is a, a high-powered motor. Is that the more oil I should be running in that? That's probably your best bet, and that is a flat tappet cam in your motor. I'm sorry. You are running a flat tappet cam. Oh yeah. Yeah, you probably best bet is to run that higher uh, dispersancy. Is it uh, which uh, Valvoline product? Is it Premium Blue or? I believe it's a blue. Yeah, it, and you know it's a, that oil usually has around twelve to fourteen hundred parts per million zinc, and your your standard gasoline engine oils are around eight hundred. And so that additional four to 500 parts per million zinc is going to extend that life of your cam, and it should help you out immensely. Well, the next question is, is to do the analysis, I figure when I go to change the oil next time, just keep some of it, bring it to you? That You can do that. And the biggest thing is when you take a sample and when you take it during an oil drain, don't take that sample right when you pull the drain plug. Let at least a quart come out and then pull the sample because if you take it right from the you know when it starts coming out of the drain plug you're going to get some sludge that forms up around the drain plug and if there's a mag plug you're going to get a shot of iron and so it's best to get a representative sample is to let at least a quart out and then take your sample and jim well, and you and the other thing too is we've got to have a clean container it, you can't you know take some brake clean and wipe out this old baby food jar mm -hmm. maybe i guess what that might be suitable if it was fresh out of the dishwasher and clean but, Jim, what you can do is, is get a hold of us at bumper to bumper radio com, and we'll get you in touch with somebody that can help you with that oil sample or get you in touch with Jason uh, to do that. I mean, you're not a retail outlet, but I'm sure you'll you, – you're a gearhead. You're a car guy, so I know you want to do this test and see it. It's, yeah, it's, uh, exactly. It, it's, it's, it's running oils in your blood probably if we tapped into your <laughs> arm right there. We might get a – get a drop or two of Valvoline out of there. <laughs> well, I, mean, I mentioned before the break, as Jason brought up this morning, as far as just changing brands. You don't necessarily want to change 
brands of oil every time you do an oil change, do you? It, I, I mean, you can, but it's not probably your best practice. You're pro, you're, you want to stick with one brand. I mean, if you choose a brand, stick with it. And you know, most of the major brands of oil now are about the same cost per quart. And so, you know, price shopping is probably not your best benefit because what happens is if you change brands of oil, there's a different chemistry that goes into your engine. And what it will do is it will cause all the varnishes that are formed in your engine. And if you have lube oil coolers or what have you, those varnishes will get resuspended, and those varnishes consist of corrosion metals. And so if you do an oil analysis, I'm going to tell you you have wear, high wear metals, especially if it's a first-time sample. I haven't had a trend. And I may be telling you you may have issues when, in fact, it is you just went, went and got uh, 25 cents less a quart. Right. So it may not always be the good thing. And I, Is it possible that those additives that then become suspended are those other particles that have just stayed in the engine because of the different makeup of oil or detergents, could that plug a filter up? No, most no? likely okay. not. The corrosion metals are very small in size, and you know, oil filters themselves are normally, I believe, between 20 and 25 micron in size uh, filterability anyways. And we're dealing with corrosion metals that are around 1 to 2 micron in size. So they're just going to flow through their engine. They're not going to cause any abrasion, you know, but it will show up on my oil analysis, and I, I would tell you you have wear metals. For sure. Well, thanks for the call, Jim. We're going to go with Don in Mesa. Looks like he's got a loop question. Go ahead, Don. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for taking my call. Good morning. Um, First question is, what do you think of Slick 50? I Personally, I don't uh, recommend uh, aftermarket additives. You know, oil, oil companies spend millions of dollars formulating your oils to work in your engines. And if there's occasions where if you put a aftermarket additive, and I'm not going to say Slick 50 or anything else, it okay. may have an adverse effect in your engine. Um, okay, I but have, you, you, you understand Slick 50 does not treat the oil, it treats the engine parts. That's correct, but is, you know, what we see is, does it actually mix readily with your oil? The Slick 50, okay. you know, and, and, and the thing is, if it doesn't mix readily in your oil, it'll actually possibly cause an adverse wear phenomena. And we've seen, and I'm, and I'm not going to say Slick 50 does this because I, I haven't seen it happen with Slick 50, but we've seen some other aftermarket additives actually have an adverse effect on the additive package of the oil itself and cause the oil itself to sludge up. So they may or may not be a bad thing, and we use Slick 50 in the general term of mm-hmm. uh, give me a Coke. It doesn't. I mean, we're not talking Coke, Pepsi, RC, or Slick 50, QMI, uh, Prestone, whatever the STP, whatever. Just, just in general, it could be a good thing, but you have to know if it is really compatible with the right. oil. Uh, you know, uh, mayonnaise doesn't taste good on a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I don't right. think so. I mean, that's that's a that's a, I mean, that's just I'm making a huge difference. It's if it's it mayonnaise is good, but not on a peanut butter and jelly. It's got to work together. So. Yeah, and there are additives out there. My you know, my dad ran Slick 50 in every oil change on his truck, and he got uh, 350 thousand miles out of it. And, you know, there are additives at work, but I'm also saying there's additives that may be adverse effect. Okay, you drive a Dodge truck diesel. Mm -hmm. How often do you change your engine oil? Well, since I drive in the city, I uh, change it about every 8,000 miles. About every 8,000 miles. We were talking about the dust in the valley that gets into your engine oil, talking about air filters, and we talk about, you know, how often do you change your engine oil? Well, if there's a haboob... I probably want an oil change and an air filter. What about you? Well, I don't know about right away, but I can hear the phone call. What are you, crazy? You told my wife that we had dirty oil and she needed to change the air filter. Are you crazy? What are you trying to do? Well, believe it or not, the oil, the air filter, and we can talk about that more, has an effect on the oil. When we come back, we've got open lines at 602-277-5827. You are listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm Matt Allen. This guy over here is Dave Riccio, and we are talking oil today. And we've got Jason Cronlin joining us, who is a tribologist, probably the def- – well, I, not probably. He is the smartest guy in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and, Dave, it's a little funky smelling in here. What's up with you today? Oh, You're stinking a little bit. <laughs> well, I went, for, I went for a mountain bike ride early this morning with Michael Henry, who's the guy behind the scenes at Bumper to Bumper Radio. Wait, you said, wait a minute. You said Michael Crash Henry. Michael Crash That's what Henry. you said before. Last week I got a text from him. It sounded like he was in the bushes because he went over the handlebars on his mountain bike. But uh, he didn't look too banged up today. But we got on a good ride this morning, and he and I talk forever, 
and I was trying to leave so I get home and get a shower, and I just didn't get one. <laughs> so that's the explanation behind. <laughs> that's why it's stupid. <laughs> 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 oh god, I'm not even gonna go there. So, oil it, it's uh it's the hot talk it, hot topic three thousand miles five thousand miles. Do I need synthetic? Would should I change it? Wouldn't shouldn't I change it? What's going on? What's cheap? What's not? When we before we we broke away though we were talking about air filters and maybe some of the things. What's the worst things you can do to hurt your oil or to kill the engine oil life, which then results in reduced engine life so you know you want to keep this car these cars are going two hundred thousand miles today but then we see some cars are just jalopies at 70 <laughs> uh so some of the things jason that can can uh hurt your engine oil i mean i'll start with one clearly is a poorly running engine right. we don't see it so much on non-carbureted cars but a carbureted car that's over fueling that's just going to dilute the oil and wipe it out that's correct uh, we teased a little bit with the air filter. What's an air filter got to do with my oil life? Come well, on. Basically, with the air filter, you know, and everything with extending your oil life and making sure your oil is still usable is keeping out the contaminants. And an air filter is probably the biggest source of, of major contamination in your oil. And because of our Arizona dirt being such a fine particulate, um, <clears throat> a filter that is starting to get plugged or is not being serviced has a uh, greater propensity to actually draw dirt into the intake, which will eventually get into the upper cylinder region and start polishing uh, your engine and taking out your pistons, rings, and cylinders. And shiny's not necessarily good in that case. <laughs> no. We're not talking about uh, Danny's polish, polish job on the no, paint, right? No, and, and, and one dirt entry can significantly diminish an engine's life, maybe up to 20%, 25%. Well, air filters are, are fairly inexpensive, mm -hmm. so... Uh, you know, someone might consider changing one at least once a year. And if you're going to a regular shop and you got a relationship, they're telling you when your air filter is dirty. But at the same time, if 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 you're not getting into a shop regularly, it's something that needs to be done and reduces the life of the engine. Yeah. I mean, because those are little, those are like little little uh, pieces of uh, you said quartz, granite. I don't know what's. Yeah, it's uh, well, our Arizona dirt is silicon based, but it is um, basically like a piece of quartz, a uh, polishing compound that's going through your engine. And, and obviously we want to keep that out. And so routine maintenance of your air filter, and that means changing it. Don't just take it out and dust it off. Actually, yeah. don't even do that, yeah. period. Don't right. shake it. Don't throw it on the ground. Don't drop it. Don't get your vacuum cleaner or your air compressor or blow it out. Just just replace it. Yeah. Just, For period. the cost, it's it relatively cheap enough. It's cheap insurance. Just change change the filter. Well, I know at my shop, we vacuum out the air filter box. How many times you pull an air filter out? Oh, and the box, kind of box is yeah. all is all dirty in there. So, And then the last thing, I guess, or not the last thing, but we had three things that we were going to talk about with the, the deal was warming the engine up. You can't just, we don't need to warm the engine up, you know, let it run like you did your old car in the wintertime for a half hour, but a half a mile or a mile before you start romping on the car, the worst thing to do is go get in the car and floorboard the thing on getting on the freeway, and it's only been running for 45 seconds. Right. Yeah, your engine's not up to temperature, uh, and the oil's not up to temperature, so it's running a little bit thicker. Does that And that may mean that your lubricant's not getting to the areas that really need it, an up, upper cylinder region, maybe your camshaft area, your heads, your valves. And, and, you, and you said there's also some condensation in the oil, too. Yeah. From yeah, during the combustion process, water is naturally formed. And so if an oil is not up to temperature, that water is getting into the crankcase. And it's basically, you know, with the water being present during the combustion process, there's also acids that are formed. And so if your oil doesn't get hot enough to cook that water out of there, you're going to start forming carbon silic acids and sulfuric acids. And guess what? Those are corrosives. And they're going to start taking out your engine. That means bad. Okay. Well, we've got a very patient, very, very patient, when I say patient, Frank from Phoenix with a lubrication question. Frank, what can we help you with? I'd like to ask Jason about these oil life monitors on the new cars. Like, my current vehicle, I've got over 305,000 on the original engine, and I just have a hard time going over 7,000 miles between oil changes. Well, I would say that's probably why you have 305,000 <laughs> miles on the, on the engine, first of all, but... That's a good question, Jason. What do you know about the 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 engineering behind that oil life mapping? I think is really what that is. Yeah, I believe the mapping sensors are based basically looking at conductivity of the oil. And as contaminants form and oxidation products form, the oil becomes more conductive. And basically, what it's measuring is just like a like a pH probe or a probe that actually is measuring um, the degradation of the oil itself. 
and um, you know, seven thousand mile change. That's that's very good. Are, is your driving, Frank, all in city driving? Yeah, well, this is on an 09 Equinox, and I mean, the, the change oil light doesn't come on till after seven thousand miles. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I just think that that that's something that the car manufacturers are selling as. You know, you don't have to service your car for 7,000 miles. But I don't think that's going to maximize your engine life. Well, we always talk about that on the show, and I call that the marketing department being out of touch with the reality or the engineering department. And But, Jason, I think it's a little bit different. I, I have not seen a, a passenger car that is actually checking the conductivity because there would have to be two probes checking that oil. Mm-hmm. Um, my understanding of the way it works is that – there is a mapping. It's just like a fuel injection, a, a map of when you have X throttle and this temperature and this temperature and this scenario, this is how much fuel is going to be delivered. My understanding is that there's a program written in that computer system that monitors. It knows how long the engine typically runs for. It knows the startup temperature, the the runtime, the heat. And based on all these different scenarios, I guess it's kind of like your credit report. You really don't know what makes that number the number unless there's some event but i'm gonna but, go get a peanut butter and jelly with mayonnaise, with on mayo, it. right <laughs> but the but the i mean you could take another equinox the same car and drive that one short trips five miles four times a day or jump in that car the same day and go drive down the highway and i know those lights are not going to come on at the same time right so there is some engineering behind that i'm sure somebody got paid gazillions of dollars and they spent billions of dollars uh, figuring that out, trying to make low cost maintenance, but again, reality. I wouldn't wait on a BMW. It'll go fifteen thousand miles. I'm not waiting. Well, Just you said it earlier in the show. These cars are lasting two hundred thousand miles. Three. If you want them to, but then there's some cars that are jalopies after seventy thousand miles. And the reality, folks, is you can burn an awful lot of your wealth up in your car. You know, if you're not taking care of your car and you're throwing away and just getting another one. Or, you know what, if you maintain it, get 200,000 miles out of it and, and have more money in your pocket to spend on something else. Take care of the car because it is, you know, I remember there was a time and place where at 100,000 miles, a car was just worn out. You know, those days are gone, you know, and now they are lasting 200,000 miles. And, you know, I don't know if that does any good for the manufacturer to sell more cars, maybe more parts. But, you know, they're not, the, the car lasts a long time. Is, is that what they want? Well, and the free maintenance deal that you get on these cars, it's just to get you out of the warranty. We see cars that we're doing the service on more frequently while they still have their free ones at the dealer. We take care of it on the interim. And then the people stop going to the dealer and they come to us after they've absorbed all the freebies and only got four oil changes. Instead, we've given them eight. And in the car that was at the dealer is falling apart. And, and has these other oil-related issues with crankcase ventilation and stuff. And we're not seeing that on the cars that we're doing interim services on. And for these auto shops, a lot of thought, at least I know at Virginia Auto Service, Matt and I have talked about this a lot. We do transmission, so I don't I don't think about this all the time. But he's considering, hey, you know, we've always recommended a 3,000-mile oil change, but I thought about it, you know, the way the cars are, the way the market has changed. A 5,000-mile oil change is what we want to see on a car that's regularly maintained, it's in good shape. It's not a jalopy. You know, the jalopy actually needs to go in and see the doctor more often because other things are falling apart on it. But if a car is well maintained and always has been, a 5,000 mile oil change is not is not out of the picture. You know, env- environmentally, we're not pumping as much oil down the drain, but we're not. I think 7,000, 10,000 mile oil changes that you hear about. That's that's crazy. Well, I've said it many times. Is is it's not so much the oil change that we need. It's everything else on the car that may be falling apart around the car if if it's not getting in enough. Because even the people that do 3,000, 3,000 really isn't 3,000. 3,000 is 6,000 or, or whatever. So we'll, we are going to make that shift and, and start working in that direction to help our customers save some money and, and save money by not spending it and save money with their time as well. So uh, that will be coming so what should we do dave here what well let's sneak in hank in glendale on a 2002 saturn go ahead hank you're on bumper to bumper radio uh, thank you <clears throat> um i have about uh, close to ninety thousand miles on my car now and i've been having an electrical problem um i brought it to one place and they worked on it for about five hours and couldn't come up with it the i don't get any dash lights and my real lights are out Can you suggest somebody other than Saturn that uh, locally where I live that I might be able to bring the car to for 
have them check it out for me. You said your rear lights are out? Yeah, the rear lights are out, and so is the dash lights. Now, when you say dash lights, are we talking about the dimness of the illumination of the instruments, like the cluster lights? Yes, the cluster lights. And There's the, no lights on the dashboard. And then the brake lights or the tail lights are All out. of them. All of them are Oh, not even any brake lights either? No. Okay. Well, of course, we have a shop. First thing you can do is, is you're in Glendale. What's your major cross streets in Glendale? Um, 53rd and Thunderbird. Right around the corner, Hank. Don't even you're have kidding. to. <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, of course, you can always go to bumpertobumperradio.com, and there's a map there with a lot of great shops in Phoenix in the metropolitan area, whether it's Gilbert, Phoenix, Glendale, whatever. But right around the corner from you, 51st Avenue in Peoria is Dave's Car Care. Dave Denman has been there 30 five years, 33 years on that corner. And uh, I know he's going to be there for some time to come, long time. And that's a great facility to go in. They can handle that. That is not an issue. You're going to go there and ask for Aaron or Keenan, or maybe even you'll probably see Dave there and uh, let them know what kind of problem you're having. Take your paperwork with you so they can see what's happened in the past and, and, and have some good notes and good symptoms for them. And, uh, Sounds like it may not be an easy one, but I know they'll handle it. You may just need to part with the car for a couple of days. Well, I mentioned shop hopping when we started this show. Shop hopping, and we talk about how it's not like that sock hop thing, is it? No, it's it's what I would call an orphan. So you don't really have a shop that's your home. You don't have a relationship. You don't have a guy that you take cookies to at Christmas because he takes care of your your uh, car throughout the year. And by the way, at Tri City Transmission, we do like cookies. I'm just letting <laughs> you know now. Uh, but uh, you know. Finding a shop, sticking with a shop, having a good relationship with a shop, and not 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 looking at every job on a job basis, but looking at the car as a whole and the maintenance as a whole. When you you go to if you were to go to one doctor one time and a different doctor the next time and a different doctor, you're not actually working with anybody, and they can't see the whole approach to maintaining the car. And I think in the long run, you spend more money. If you go to this shop a la carte and get something, and this shop a la carte and get something, and that shop a la carte and get something, he doesn't know what the last guy just did because they're not talking because sometimes mechanics just aren't very good at calling each other up and talking. Find one guy that's going to take care of it. He's going to shoot you straight. Get a relationship with them. And we thought we used the medical analogy, but stay out of the emergency room. Don't be broken <laughs> down all the time. You'll That's find that if you're if you have that relationship, you're, you're you'll find yourself not on the side of the road and out of the finally ER. finally a good analogy from you. So when right. we come back, we are taking phone calls. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. My pappy said, "Son, you're gonna drive me to drinking if you don't stop driving that hot rod, Lincoln." Bumper to Bumper on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. All righty, we're back talking about motor oil. Dave, you look like you got scared there. Did I steal your thunder for a second? <laughs> we've been talking about motor oil, and, and uh, we've got uh, Jason, the tribologist in, the, the scientist helping us uh, help you with all these crazy oil questions and answers and, uh, and just helping you. Keep your car on the road and out of the emergency room here at Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, there's nothing better to me than science, and it's a frequently asked question on the show, should I have my transmission serviced? And, you know, I think we can now test it. We have some science behind it, and that's one of the things we're starting to do at Tri-City Transmission. People don't know. Come on by. We'll take an oil sample. We can do it right there in the driveway. We get a little vacuum, suck it out. We sent it to Jason, and, and within 24 hours, I, I know how many uh, dissolved you know, particulates are in there. Do you go, or no. does the vacuum do that part? <laughs> the, the vacuum, vacuum does. does hey, do you want to go get a uh, mayonnaise and peanut butter and jelly sandwich after the show? <laughs> no, because it doesn't work together. Now, if it, I, you know, maybe I'll add some honey. That I know that works. Right? <laughs> or so a, or we're a gonna, banana. We're going to start testing, and we want to see what a trend is. You know, how many miles on a particular transmission or a particular type of car and, and what are we seeing, and in, in when is the oil, you know, when is it breaking down? And one of the things we're going to do, uh, some of an acid test on there, Jason, maybe you can explain that to me. Well, basically what we're looking at is uh, we're going to do a test. We're going to look, obviously, for wear metals and contamination. We're also going to do a particle count, which we look for uh, is clutch material, which has been always generated in a transmission. So we're going to look at to see how much clutch debris is in that fluid sample. And then we also look at what they call a total acid number. And basically, that total acid number is, me is measuring the degradation of your fluid. And if your acid number is too high, the oil is not is obviously losing its properties, and it needs to be changed. So it's it's a little more scientific whether as I should service my transmission or not. Or you know, what do you think? How do you feel? How's the wind blowing? Should we service it? I don't know. 
There's something behind it besides the kid at the lube shop going, this, this needs to be changed. That's what they trained me to do here. We can get these done by the time the car's being washed almost and crank this thing out. Once in a while, I'll pull a dipstick out and I'll put it on the tip of my tongue and I do it with a straight face and see what the customer says. I say, hmm, so you don't like it needs a service. So let's go with Michael in Buckeye on a 2008 Saturn. Go ahead, Michael. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, thanks for taking my call. Appreciate it because this question's kind of bugged me. I recently had some ser- some tranny service done on my uh, 2008 Saturn Outlook, and the service tech down there told me that it's not a bad idea. He said it, it works really well to pull a quart of oil out of your crankcase and run a quart of transmission fluid through it, and that would actually clean the inside of the engine. And I just wanted to know, is is that on the level? Is that something that I should consider doing, or should I just ignore that completely and just go with standard oil changes? Jason's got a look on his face, but my first gut is, yeah, 1975 maybe. Yeah, I would uh, stick with your oil, Michael. I mean, the tranny fluid does have a good detergency in it, and it would flush it, but what you're losing is your dispersants. And if you take, and with that uh, sump capacity, you've probably got, what, three and a half, four quarts of oil. Um, you're diluting it by 25% with tranny fluid, which doesn't have heavy dispersancy. And so then you may have a higher propensity. This oil may sludge up over time. Um, You could have it as a flush, but then put your regular oil right back in, or just stick with a good brand oil and just uh, keep on trucking. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's uh, what Dave calls the farm mentality. You know, the kind <laughs> it's of like that, putting brake fluid in your transmission yeah, to, no, to fix a problem. Yeah, time to move on if you're doing that. Given you know, if that's the advice you're given. Well, but, and these, I mean, we had we had uh, Cameron Thomas in here with us, and he was explaining the way these oils are designed. There's a lot of science into making it do what it's supposed to do. I mean, it's designed to to you know to keep the engine clean and and do all those things. We don't have to go. You know, backyard. You know, hey, I'm going to pour this this in there and clean things up. Here's some snake oil for you, boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and we might see a, a engine that I mean, it just comes in. This thing is gnarly. The oil is black. It's just disgusting. You put you put your change the filter, put four quarts back in it, and it is gnarly and nasty and dirty. So we might put an additive in there, something to flush that oil out. But we always do a second change, too. And this is one thing that came up talking with you several months ago, Jason, was the you can do this flush, but you're never going to get all that out. So now is there some of that flush fluid now in your brand new oil breaking down the oil? Then what happens? Well, you just basically, if you do something like that, you want to do a short change interval. And you want to basically, every time you do an oil change, you get about 10% residual oil in your in your system, be it in the lube oil coolers or in the lines themselves. So you want to basically just dilute it out. And the best solution to pollution is dilution. And so you want to, you know, just keep changing your oil, and eventually the flush compound will, <clears throat> will, will come out, and you'll be fine. As well as all the nastiness and the sludge and, and the other. And that's another good point, too, is... I used to work at Porsche, and we would do these services. And when I first started learning and working there in my teens, I thought they'd say, you got to get the oil warmed up. Go run the car and get it hot. I'm like, what are you, crazy? I'm going to change the oil in this million-degree car. And I said, no, you've got to get the oil hot, get all that junk suspended, and then drain it out. It doesn't do any good to change the oil on a cold engine either, right? That is correct. I mean, you have a lot of pockets in that engine. And what's going to collect in those pockets is the heavy debris, sludge, compounds like that. You do a cold oil change, that oil, A, is flowing slower, so you're not going to get the tur- uh, the turbulence coming out to really kind of flush out the crankcase as well. well and Go ahead. Go ahead. No, that's okay. With these extended oil changes that you know people are doing, you're seeing <coughs> engines come in that are sludged up that don't have that many miles on them. And I'm, I'm, I'm totally against the manufacturers that are saying these oils last, you know, like they do as far as the automotive manufacturers that are extending the oil change intervals because you're sludging up motors. And the other thing is you take a vehicle that holds three and a half to four quarts of oil in the engine and it consumes, all engines consume oil at a certain, certain rate. So it's a half quart per, per 5,000 miles or whatever it may be. If you're not checking the engine oil level, and I don't know a lot of consumers that 
do go check their engine oil. I mean, it used to be a, everyone knew how to check their engine oil. It's a thing of the past. People don't even pop the hood. Well, and, and quickly, too, Jason, uh, synthetic oils. I've always been the case, don't use synthetic oil to extend your interval. Use it for protection. Mm-hmm. And we talked about that a little bit during the break. So what's your take quickly on, uh, on synthetics? Well, synthetics have fantastic antioxidant properties. And what you want to do is make sure, whichever oil you use, make sure you keep the contaminants out. You know, for the dollar, how much synthetic oil is, you want to make sure you keep that oil clean. And it will be serviceable. For sure. Well, if you guys want to know more about uh, getting your oil analyzed by the tribologist, I think I said that right, you can email us at bumpertobumperradio.com. We can get you to the people who can get you in touch with Jason. Or if you want your oil analyzed, uh, you know, something we can handle. If you're looking for a relationship with a great shop, Bumper to BumperRadio.com. No more shop hopping. Pick one of these shops, stick with them, and uh, we'll be back next week. Remember never to text and drive.